Okay. Okay. And then also, yeah, just let me know if you guys can't hear. Um, I think I'll just speak without my mask so that people can hear me more clearly. Okay, so I guess for those in person, you guys can see the screen and yeah, I can just look at the laptop to um, explain each slide. Um, and also just feel free to interrupt me with questions. I want this like weekly group meeting to be informal so that everyone feels comfortable like asking questions. And um, we're all here to learn about like new concepts and what everyone is doing. So yeah. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about some of the um, basics and history and why we're actually doing um, simulation work in the first place. And um, just as a side note, um, most of these um, like concepts and like the slide structure was taken from um, my my graduate my my graduate school um, courses. Um, so just FYI, these were kind of mo motivated by Professor Tom Marklin's um, Chem two seventy five slides um, back in back in two thousand thirteen. Yeah, <laughs> at Stanford. Okay, so. Um, First, I just want to start off like why we're doing um, computational modeling in the first place. Oh, actually, um, is there a chat? Um, let me let me see if sounds clear. Oh, okay, 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 good, good, okay. Um, okay, going back. Okay, so um, why do we actually care about doing computational molecular modeling in the first place? So, you know, there are various reasons why um, we're doing this. Like the very first obvious reason is that with um, molecular modeling, um, you can actually visualize the molecular systems and see like how the conformation changes, et cetera. And we can actually get a visual picture and a movie, which is really cool. And then we can also gain um, insight into their structure and dynamics and mechanisms so that we can actually control these um, properties and systems of interest and hopefully also develop new materials that are um, benefit to society. And the second reason is that with these um, molecular modeling techniques, like um, in, including um, density functional theory for quantum mechanical calculations and molecular dynamic simulations, we can actually see these molecules and particles at a higher resolution than experiments. And so we can gain real atomic insight into how these um, structures form and move, et cetera. So we can actually gain um, more information from these simulations. Of course, um, we need both experiments and simulations to really understand the system of interest, but um, simulations offer this higher resolution than experiments, which is really useful. And then with, with these simulations, we can also predict experimental results um, and test out different conditions. And so we don't have to actually run these experiments one by one. Um, and we can actually predict what will happen at these um, different conditions. And sometimes we can also test conditions that are actually not possible um, experimentally. So um, that's really cool. And then in addition with um, these simulations, we can also save a lot of um, cost in terms of time and resources. And an easy example is for instance, if we had to struggle, uh, if we had to screen a drug um, for a particular target, um, instead of actually testing each of these drug candidates one by one, we can actually narrow down the list um, that we can test experimentally by using um, computer-aided drug discovery, et cetera. So um, computational molecular modeling offers like really useful tools um, in that sense. And finally, um, we can also obtain very useful information from these systems, including thermodynamic properties, which includes binding free energies, free energy landscape, and also kinetic properties like rate constants, continuous pathways, Etc. And then using all this information, we can really understand the biomolecule or protein or system of interest um, in a fuller detail that would have not been possible um, otherwise. Um, and so I think these are most of the main um, motivation reasons why we study computational molecular modeling. Um, are there any things that you guys want to add um, on top of these? Yeah, feel free to, yeah. 
just say it out loud if if you guys can think of anything else um i think i pointed out the main ones but okay okay then we'll move on to the next slide but um yeah if you guys can think of any other reasons then let me know and so with that, um, since I've introduced the motivation for why we do molecular modeling in the first place, I just want to briefly touch base on the history of simulations. And yeah, I'm sorry, I, I guess I mostly focused on MD. I should have added, um, you know, quantum mechanical calculations like this history of DFT. I'm less familiar with it, so I didn't add it, but I'll definitely um, look it up and try to include it next time. So um, yeah, in terms of um, MD simulations, so the first molecular dynamics or MD simulation was actually done in 1956. Um, and this was done for hard spheres. And so, you know, if the first MD simulation was in 1956, it's relatively a pretty new field compared to other scientific fields. And then after that, um, we had um, MD simulation of interacting argon atoms in 1964. And then um, in the 60s and 70s, now you can kind of see like some interesting MD simulations of interesting systems, such as um, we had the first MD of molecules um, back in 1968. In 76, we had the first MD of a biological process or photoisomerization that's involved in the vision process. And this was done by Ariel Warshaw. And then in 1977, the first MD simulation of a protein was done by um, Martin Karplus. And, you know, this protein system only consisted of 500 atoms and it was only ran for 9.2 picosecond, which seems super, super short um, nowadays. Like we can just do that like super, super quickly on our like computers and workstations. So, but back then that was pretty revolutionary. And then in 1988, um, the first MD of a protein and explicit solvent was done by um, Michael Levitt. And, and so since then, you know, there's been a lot of progress made in this field. And in 2013, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to these um, three people, um, Warshall, Carplus, and Levitt, um, that I've mentioned just before, for the development of multi-scale models for complex chemical systems. And so I think, um, you know, MD simulations are becoming really quintessential tools in many different fields, including biology, chemistry, um, chemical and biomolecular engineering, material science, et cetera. And, um, you know, with the Nobel Prize, I think um, it really recognized the contributions and um, the promise for this field. And say for DFT too, I'm sorry for not including, um, you know, the DFT work. Um, but I'll do that next time. Um, yeah. And so um, what are happening with simulations now? Like what's really the state of the art um, with these MD simulations? And so, um, you know, there are some notable um, computing si systems to note. The first one is Folding at Home, which was um, developed by Vijay Pandey back in 2000 when he was a professor at Stanford University. And now it's led by um, Professor Greg Bowman, um, now at UPenn. And this folding at home, um, you guys can feel free to install it on your laptops and computers if you like, but it's basically a volunteering computing project to simulate proteins. That is, um, once you um, actually go to the website folding at home and download this program that, you know, installs nicely on your computer, it's not like one of those like, you know, MD simulation programs that you could you have to um, install it with the terminal. This is like very friendly. Um, it has a friendly GUI. And so um, once you install that, I think they give you work units, which you can just run on your laptop or computer. And then that will contribute to running a full scale um, atomistic system, uh, atomistic simulation of like a big protein, for instance. I think they they've done it for COVID-19 recently and for other proteins that are implicated in diseases. And so, you know, combining all of those um, volunteer compute, computers, computing powers, I think they measured that, um, that computing power to be 2.4 exaflops, um, at least back in April of 2020. And that made it the world's first um, exaflop computing system, which is pretty huge. Um, and flop, um, as 
as a reminder, flop means floating point operation per second. So that really, that's the unit that um, measures how powerful the um, computing system is. And so, you know, if it's exa, that's like 10 to the 18. And so, you know, it, it was a really, really powerful computing system and it still is today. And besides folding at home, there's also Anton, which I think many of you know about. It was first built by um, David Shaw back in 2008. Um, David Shaw um, made riches from his finance company um, in New York. And he also ha has this other company called D.E. Shaw Research, in which he uses, um, he and his um, team uses this supercomputer called Anton um, to run very long MD simulations. And this supercomputer is designed for MD. So it's super fast. It's massively parallel. And it has ran the longest MD simulation so far, which is one millisecond. And I don't think um, this record has been beat by any other um, supercomputers as of yet. And, and yeah, so those are the two um, supercomputers to note um, in terms of um, running simulations. And also, I would like to note that billion atom systems have been simulated recently. Um, for instance, um, from Los Alamos National Laboratory, they were able to simulate um, the gene of a DNA, um, which was billion atoms. And also um, at UCSD in my former postdoc lab, um, my other teammates built um, a respiratory aerosol system, which consisted of 1 billion atoms, and they were able to run um, conventional molecular dynamic simulations on that. So we've reached um, a long way from, you know, back in, you know, 1960s and 70s. And so um, here, this is a graph um, that I just pulled out from Wikipedia um, when I just clicked on the supercomputer page on Wikipedia. And I thought this was a really nice graph that shows the exponential growth of supercomputers. And so um, just as a reference, I put um, what the um, computing power is for the latest iPhone 14 Pro. That um, is like two teraflops and that's pretty much equivalent to, you know, the best supercomputer back in like, I guess 2000 or 1999. And then um, the NVIDIA A100 GPUs, um, which will soon be installed in the on on lab um, HPC two cluster. Um, I mean, they're coming in March, and I ordered them back in August, so it's been it's been quite delayed. But you know, these GPUs are um, also pretty state of the art GPUs that you can purchase, although they're very expensive. But you know, they're pretty powerful too. They have um, three hundred over three hundred um, teraflops, which is in this range. And then right now, um, the best supercomputer in the world is um, within here. And so, you know, supercomputers will become more and more powerful um, as time goes on, and we'll be able to s simulate larger and longer timescales, which is, you know, really, really exciting. And so, um, I would like to just reemphasize that, you know, over the past um, over 60 years, we have moved from simulating, you know, femtosecond time scales, which is 10 to the negative 15 for tens of atoms um, when they, when researchers first started using MD to study um, systems. Now we can actually simulate up to milliseconds, 10 to the negative three and for billions of them. Well, although the billion atom systems, I don't think they were run for that long, only like, you know, small systems were run up to milliseconds, but still like, these are like the time scales and um, and spatial scales that we can reach now with um, our state of the art techniques, which is really cool. And you know, I I looked at this. Um, there was this sentence um, also like back when I took this course um, in graduate school, and then for that one that said over the past fifty years we have moved from simulating femtoseconds to tens of atoms to millisecond, which is still the same, like, you know, 10 years later, but back then I think it was only like, um, like million atoms. So, you know, we've come a long way, like even within the past 10 years. 
However, um, I would like to emphasize that, you know, although we've come a long way, we still have a long way to go. We still need to reach longer temporal and larger spatial scales um, to reach experimentally relevant systems and problems. And we still have, um, we'll, we still need to obtain accurate force fields for these MD simulations. And I'll come back to force fields later, but force fields refer to functional forms and parameters that's needed to calculate forces and energies between atoms. And this might make more sense um, after I show the equation that describes um, force fields. And so I found this um, nice graph where um, on the x-axis, you can see um, the system size scale. And then here we can see the temporal scale or the time scale. And you know these are the different simulation methods that we can use to tackle you know a certain um, time time scale and also spatial scale. So of course you know ab initio and quantum mechanical calculations they can handle system sizes um, that are small and kind of short. But you know these are the most um, accurate methods that there are in order to simulate molecular systems and chemical kinetics. And then the next level, which is a bit faster, but less accurate would be atomistic and molecular modeling, MD, which is what um, Professor Roland Fowler and I do. And then the next level would be dislocation dynamics, and then more coarse-grained or mesoscale continuum simulations. And the final would be um, engineering components. Oh, whoops, I think I, oh, whoops, I, I made a copy of <laughs> this slide. Okay, this slide wasn't needed. Um, I'll move on to the next one. Um, does that, anyone have questions so far or comments? No, everything's understandable. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for, yeah, speaking because I can't see the chat. Um, okay, um, yeah, so, you know, that was basically kind of the history of um, MD simulations. And I just wanted to introduce that because I wanted us to, you know, appreciate how far we've come, like, you know, since this field began in the 1960s. And so with that, um, I'll introduce, um, you know, the MD simulation scheme, um, you know, in a gist. And so, you know, in MD simulations, or, I mean, I think it's similar to, Abin I mean, this, this procedure is also the same for, other simulation procedures. But first, um, we have an initial structure of a protein or biomolecule, for instance. We can easily get this from you know, the protein data bank base, like online, you know, where experimentalists submit like all these um, crystal structures of like proteins and biomolecules. Or you can also create your initial structure um, yourself. And then from there, after we equilibrate the system um, for a good period of time, then the MD simulation essentially just repeats these um, three processes. So first, um, from the initial structure, we can get the energy and forces. And from there, we can evolve the system for, um, for a short time step. And then from there, we can calculate observables, including um, energy, structure, pressure, et cetera. And then we essentially repeat the cycle until we have the average of observables that we need um, to be converged. And this is the general um, scheme for simulations. And then um, using MD simulations, we can generate a series of trajectories. Um, and I highlighted um, these words that are kind of um, jargon to to the MD simulation um, field. Um, and these trajectories um, produce a series of configurations or confirmations. Um, you know, they're referred to e either, I mean, either word is used for, um, you know, configurations or confirmations within the um, chemical phase space or configuration space or confirmational space. And our goal is to, you know, sample as many points in the configuration space with the probability proportional to its weight within the configuration space. And that way we can sample, you know, all the relevant um, structures that um, this system undergoes. 
And then also we'll be able to get all the observable data, including like energies, um, rate constants, et cetera, um, that we need um, from the simulation. Uh, any questions so far? No, okay. And so, um, you know, some people might be wondering, so, you know, MD simulations are simulations and pe now people understand like, um, now you understand that you use these to, you know, study, you know, proteins and biomolecules and um, they change conformations, et cetera, but you know, how, how, how do they actually change? And so MD simulations use Newton's equations of motion to evolve the system. So at every time step, we get a different position and momentum, and we just repeat this process for many iterations um, until we get the converged results. And so um, here, I would like to note that in MD simulations, like really small time steps are used, um, femtosecond time steps, and that's because we're limited by the fastest motions in the system, such as bond stretches that are, you know, that have a period of like 10 femtoseconds and bond, bonds bending, which has a period of 20 femtoseconds. And so we're not allowed to increase the time step further from femtosecond time steps. And so that's one of the main reasons why um, using MD simulations, we can't reach the um, time scales of processes that we're interested, which is usually like microseconds, milliseconds or longer. Well, we can use, we can actually reach microseconds now, but you know, milliseconds is still, pretty tough unless you have, you know, unlimited access to Anton. And so, um, you know, in the initial simulation steps, um, I would like to emphasize that, you know, we should always equilibrate the system before collecting observables. And this equilibration period should ideally be longer than the correlation time or the time it takes for the particle to forget about its initial state. And, you know, I mean, but in practice, we don't really know how long the correlation time is. So we can't really pick the equilibration period um, that's ideally longer than the correlation time. But, um, but most of the time, at least um, in the, you know, protein MD community, like depending on the size of the system, we know like what um, equilibration period is appropriate. And also, um, even after equilibration and when we're doing the production MD step, we often use, um, you know, the later simulation trajectories to collect the observables and not the initial, because we, we know that it takes a while for the system to reach equi equilibrium, so. And so um, to go into more detail of, um, how MD simulations use Newton's laws of motion to um, evolve the system throughout time. We um, use these simple functions um, that are listed here um, for the potential energies. Um, here um, it says the potential energy um, in AMBER because um, AMBER is one of the MD simulation programs that are out there, but you know there are others like Gromax, LAMPS, um, NAMD, et cetera. And, all of them have slightly different um, simple equations to calculate the potential of the system of interest. And this is um, a particular potential energy function just for the AMBER MD simulation engine. And here um, we use these kinds of simple functions and you can see that you know they have all these coefficients, right? And so in order to um, get the coefficient values, we often fit them to, uh, to experimental data to reproduce the experimental results within our MD simulations. And these are referred to as empirical potentials because we're getting all, this, all these parameters from the experimental data. So that's why they're empirical. Um, there are some potentials that use um, quantum mechanical calculations and, um, but they're not um, referred to as empirical potentials. And so, here, um, I want to explain this um, potential energy function a, a bit more detail. So, you know, this has a lot of parts, right? So, you know, the first um, three parts represent the intramolecular or bonded potential energies um, that exist within a molecule. And so here, the very first term represents the harmonic stretches. 
the second term represents the bends um, that's dependent on the angle. And then the third term represents the torsions, and that depends on the dihedral angles here. And then these last two terms represent the intermolecular or non-bonded forces that exist within the system. So, you know, the first, this um, fourth term represents the van der Waals interactions um, with repulsive and attractive forces. And then the last term represents the Coulombic interactions. And so, you know, using this um, equation to calculate the potential, I mean, it is a pretty good approximation for, um, and it tries to account for most of the um, interactions that exist within a system. And it has worked well for, you know, well-studied systems like proteins, but, you know, more development is still needed in this area to get, you know, parameters that are parameter values that are more correct. And then also um, these functional forms are very simple and sometimes we need more complicated ones to actually reproduce experimental results. And so a lot of people within the MD simulation community, they're um, people who just dedicate to like force field development. Um, but unfortunately, like um, I don't work in that area, but it's still a really important area nonetheless, because without having these um, accurate force fields, then, you know, we can't really trust our simulation results. So we need to use um, as accurate force fields as possible that's available to us. And so um, with that, um, oh, okay, I just have one more slide. Um, so with that, um, I also want to introduce um, periodic boundary conditions, which we all use for our MD simulations. And the main purpose for using periodic boundary conditions is to, for us to approximate an infinite system. So, you know, realistically, like within our simulation, our simulation is only this big, like maybe like, you know, 20 angstrom cubic box, for instance. But in reality, you know, there, there are no boundaries, right? And, you know, it's actually like a large or infinite system. And so in order to approximate that, then we use periodic boundary conditions. So we basically um, have the same image on all these sides like X, Y, Z, um, so that we can actually approximate an infinite system. And so here, for instance, um, if a particle leaves the simulation box, like maybe on the right side, then it actually re-enters from the left. And so, um, and so that's one thing to note. And then the other thing to note is that, um, you know, since these particles can interact with their closest image, or and this is referred to as minimum image convention, it's really important to actually surround the system uh, or pad the system with water sufficiently. Um, you know, I think usually 10 to 20 angstrom thickness is um, enough so that, you know, artifacts are not introduced. So for instance, like if we didn't pad the system, um, you know, enough, then these other particles that wouldn't be actually interacting with um, the opposite side particles would be interacting because um, the box is like too thin. And so that's um, really important to note. Um, I've also experienced this when I actually ran these MD simulations. So um, just wanted to note that. I have a question. Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about for the systems in vacuum? Uh, I Oh, in vacuum, um, yeah, for vacuum, that doesn't matter. Yeah, it, um, I guess I'm only referring to explicit solvent um, okay. options. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so with that, um, yeah, I'll take any questions and um, comments and we can, yeah, discuss anything um, in the remaining time. Yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question. Yeah. So from your experience, uh, what do you think is the optimal way to find the minimal uh, padding length or volume? Um, I mean, I think from my experience, like, yeah, like, so I, I said like 10 to 20. So, I mean, I've used like 15 for most systems, 15 angstrom thickness, um, just, just to be on the safe side. Um, but I had to do like 20 for like really large systems like the spike protein, for instance. And I think um, like one good way to actually check whether your water thickness is enough is like when you're running like your equilibrium simulation, 
you can just check from VMD to see like whether the other image is interacting with your original image. And then it's if it seems like, you know, particles are interacting with each other when they're not supposed to because, you know, they're on the opposite sides, um, then that tells you like, oh, okay, I need to actually um, adjust the water box. So yeah, that's what I usually do. Mm. Is it is it something like uh, I'm I'm not sure. Like just say like we do some kind of uh, NPT simulation where we are allowing the volume to change. Oh, okay, I see. Shouldn't uh, like I mean like shouldn't that take the these artifacts into account and like give us the optimal volume? Uh, but I think even with NPT, like I think if the water thickness was not thick enough then yeah i saw like you know atoms interacting that they're but yeah, when, when they're not supposed to NPT, if there are, if, if, even if the volume is optimized there are still chances of outside the box interactions or with proper period conditions and proper padding of what like mm -hmm. solvents on either side of the box is required oh wait, wait wait can you say that again sorry i think what i think is that uh on his question so even uh -huh. if we do an npt and uh -huh. this is an optimized volume mm -hmm. we still require the say if we are having a uh, solvent uh, biphasic system simulations mm -hmm. we need to have the same phase on both ends of the box oh yeah yeah. otherwise yeah. there'll be out of the box interactions which are uh which are not relevant to our calculations but will still be con uh, which but will still be estimated by the simulation software mm -hmm. yeah so we um so we can sorry can you repeat your question about the mpt part like which part are you concerned about um no sorry. so if if i understood uh the concern that you raised regarding the artifacts is that uh, sometimes if you're gonna like not give sufficient volume to our unit cell or, or the simulation box, then uh, we could have some um, incorrect interactions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Between I'm the, uh, Yeah. So what I was thinking is uh, like one when we do some kind of uh, say like we do a simulation with uh, NPT ensemble. So the system will be trying to find this um, so a sort of uh, equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So it will either expand its volume or like shrink based on the interactions. Mm -hmm. And once it it is equilibrated, we will have the simulation box volume will be somewhat equilibrium right like it will be equilibrated yeah, yeah. in terms of volume yeah, yeah. so that should basically take into account of these incorrect uh, artifacts like it shouldn't have those incorrect artifacts right uh yeah i i, I guess so yeah it's just like i experienced this for an mpt <laughs> <laughs> yeah simulation as well like even though like you know volume like like as you said like after equilibration like you know even within mpt like volume is basically constant even though it's actually allowed to change and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but like even in my experience like in mpt simulations like yeah I, I i saw that from i mean i saw like those artifacts being introduced like it, when our box wasn't big enough so yeah uh, so do you think it's like a consequence because of the box size or is it because of the force field or like the, whatever the force fields and the parameters you use for it? Oh, I think it was because of the box size. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. In my experience, but you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so Professor Shirley, I have a question about the conformational space that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Can you please just uh, like I am, yeah, here you have conformational space, configuration space. So, like, I, I just wanted a, like a basic definition of these two. Oh, I mean, I, I use all three terms interchangeably, or like these two terms, configurations and conformations. Um, I mean, I think, um, yeah, other people also use it interchangeably, like, um, I mean, yeah, so I guess um, within, at least in like the MD simulation community, like I guess when we're talking about con configuration or confirmational space, we, we 
we often refer to like the free energy landscape and and so like I guess within like MD simulations, we try to sample the free energy landscape as extensively as possible um, by running long simulations or multiple simulations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, so I'm just uh, concerned about, so most of the force fields are pairwise, right? Uh, yeah. So how do we treat uh, th if there are non-pair additive interactions, like not in the amber per se, but is there like any other force field that treats non-pair interactions or is it like during the development of force field, they try to adjust the parameters? Um, let's see. So I don't, I don't know if I'll be answering your question um directly but um there are um different kinds of force fields available I, I mean this is like i guess the most standard one with like simple functional forms and um parameter sets but um you know there are also other force fields like polarizable force fields that yeah. take into account like electronic interactions um mm -hmm. a bit more accurately there are also like reactive um force yeah. fields that mm -hmm. are pretty new and they try to um have like similar accuracy to DFT so that they can actually measure, I mean, that that they can actually simulate like bond breaking and forming, um, mm -hmm. which regular MD simulations cannot do. Right. And so, yeah, so there, there are um, a variety of different force fields, like depending on the system that you're simulating. But I think this, um, you know, regular, like simple force field, like I think that has been working well for at least like proteins and biomolecules so far. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I have one more question. Um, so to, to, to treat long range interactions, mm -hmm. so most of the MD simulations are cut off based, right? Oh yeah. 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 That, that's the part that, yeah, I, yeah, didn't have time to like introduce. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're cut offs introduced so that, you know, um, the computational cost is saved. Right. Uh, yeah, maybe one of us can take that topic and. Continue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be, yeah, th I think that would be a good, um, yeah, topic to talk about, like, you know, the cutoffs and like how to deal with like many body interactions, et cetera, right. um, you know, different types of force fields. Yeah, that's also yeah. good. Okay. Thank you. Did you guys have a question or? Was it clear? Uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm most concerned about like, like you guys, <laughs> since like I think grad students kind of know the basics. But yeah, I, I was able to follow it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. More or less. Okay. Okay. That's that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So I think. Um. Let's see. If there are no other questions or comments oh oh it's already like 48 so it's almost about time um so i think um i've shared all the google spreadsheets with you guys um regarding the schedule yeah sorry i didn't fill out like my title because i had to do this last minute um yeah apologize apologies for that but um you know for the people who are going to be presenting like next week or next next week um you know try to fill in your titles as soon as possible so that you know i can send out announcement emails like weekly and yeah so i think um for those who are presenting i think you guys can either present about your current or past or ongoing research you know that's totally acceptable um it can be as long as like 20 to like 40 minutes and then um and then for those um who are pretty new i think yeah taking on like an md simulation topic or you know, it could be DFT too, like it, it could be any simulation topic, but you know, one could be like, as I mentioned, like different types of force fields, you know, that could be like one talk. Um, and then what else, you know, there are also a lot of different rare events, sampling methods within MD, you know, that could be another talk. Um, you know, there are lots of um, MD simulation topics that, you know, you guys can cover and teach us. So, but if, if you guys don't have like, a good idea of what to present, then you can, you know, talk to me or Roland or anyone and yeah. yeah.
So I think with that, um, I'll upload the recording. Um, let's see.